So the story I'm gonna to read to you today was written by a formerly enslaved man named Reverend Logan. And Reverend Logan is writing about his experience um, at a slave auction in Tennessee. He wasn't on the auction block, but he was there assisting his slave owner. Um, the slaves being auctioned off were owned by a slave owner who recently died. And in his will, his estate um, was supposed to sell off his slaves as families. And the slave owners there did not honor his wishes and ended up selling off the slaves piecemeal. And so this is the story of one of those men who refused to be sold off in that way. Reverend Logan writes about this. There was one of this ill-fated number who made his mark on this occasion and deserves a place in history. His name was Jerry. He was about 30 years of age, over six feet high, of the most critical beauty of proportions, quick of motion, of iron muscle and gigantic strength. Shakespeare would say he had the eye of Mars, the front of Jove, and the arm of Hercules. He was a husband and father, but his wife was free, and of course his children also. But put upon the block, Jerry saw he was about to be struck off to an Alabama trader. He told the trader in a solemn manner not to buy him, for that he would never leave his wife and children and be taken to Alabama. The trader made no account of Jerry's warnings and bid him off for the sum of $1,250 and handed one of his bullies a set of irons to put on him. Cases of this sort are often met by the bullies and disposed of in short order for the reason that the slavery, the slave has too much prudence or too little pluck forcibly to assert his manhood. The bully paid no attention to the threats of the insulted Negro and proceeded at once towards him to iron him. So soon as the bully came within the reach of Jerry's arm, he fell from his fist to the ground and lay as lifeless and senseless as if he had been kicked under the ear by the hoof of a racer. To all appearance, he had fought his last battle and was taken up for dead. His defiant conqueror now braved a host of enemies, led by his new master who rushed on him with bludgeons. Bravely and powerfully did the lion-hearted black man carry the war into the dense ranks of his oppressors. At John's standpoint, he was seen over their heads, his eye flashing fire, his strong arm mowing them down and piling them in heaps around him, doing his best to sell his life dear, and if possible, from their broken bones and bruised bodies, force upon them the lesson, he that taketh the sword shall perish by the sword. But alas, the heavy blows he received from all quarters were too much for him. Covered with gore, he was about to fall under a dozen heavy and probably fatal clubs when Colonel Wilkes, who was also a strong and brave man, learning the condition of his heroic slave, rushed among the assailants with streaming eyes, exclaiming, Hold up! For God's sake, hold up! What do you mean, hold up, Colonel Wilkes? cried a dozen voices. I want to compromise this matter and save this man. There's no use in killing him. He has done his best to kill us and has nearly killed many of us. Nobody, there is nobody killed yet. And the poor fellow now can do no harm, said Colonel Wilkes, pointing to Jerry, who was bending under his wounds under, against a post for support while the blood dropped down his limbs. Let me see you a moment, he added, turning towards the traitor who purchased Jerry. Colonel Wilkes was a man of great influence and greatly respected. With one consent, the battle ceased. While the traitor and the colonel held a conference apart from the crowd, the conference was soon closed and they returned to take a position beside the bleeding man, where the traitor proclaimed that the affair was amicably adjusted, that he had sold Jerry to Colonel Wilkes for $1,350 and hoped that all parties would be satisfied with their arrangement. Upon this announcement, a murmur of applause went through the crowd, and there was no demonstration. It was evident that the tables were turned, and that the bearing and bravery of this noble slave had told largely on the sympathies of the multitude. It was gratifying to Jarn to see respect and homage so bravely earned, instinctively bestowed upon a fellow slave by white people. It was a lesson to his pride and helped nourish him in the already growing American sentiment. Resistance to tyrants is obedience to God. 
Poor Jerry, bleeding and wounded as he was, came off victor in the battle. Every gash upon his body and every drop of blood therein testified to his manliness and furnished ailment to the ceaseless terror of slave insurrections. John, therefore, felt the victory was partly his own and almost envied poor Jerry when he saw Colonel Wilkes supporting him to the little cove in the brook, where the foot-washing slaves performed ablution preparatory to the sacred washing in the temple. There, the good colonel, with his face literally bathed in tears, washed Jerry's wounds until the cove blushed over with his blood. When the slave is brave, thought John, his liberty is secure. After Colonel Wilkes had cleaned the poor fellow, he led him to his own house, provided for him nurses and comforts until his wounds were healed, and then placed him upon an estate, telling him that so soon as he should return $1,350, his cost price, he should be free.